It is WrestleMania season, so I thought I want to start an epic, epic journey where we go together through the history of WrestleMania, starting right here, right now, with WrestleMania 1. I'm going on an adventure! To really understand the history of WrestleMania and WrestleMania 1, you have to know what was going on in pro wrestling at the time. The WWF had been owned up until 1982 by Vince McMahon Sr. At which point he went and sold it to his son, who now we all know as Vince McMahon, but is actually Vince McMahon Jr. Shh. He hates people calling him Jr. So if you meet him, never say that. Who the hell do you think you are? Now at the time, the world of pro wrestling was divided into what they called territories where basically little geographical areas would be controlled by different wrestling companies. And the WWF would run out of the northeast of America, so places like New York, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, in that region. But when Vince McMahon Jr. bought it, he had other ideas, so he thought, hey, why should I stay to this small area I want to conquer all of the United States. In fact, I want to conquer the world. I've got an insatiable appetite for life, and I want more, more, more. So what did he do? He started to branch out, started to get television in all these other areas where up until then, had had other wrestling companies on the TV. And once he got television, he wanted to run live events in those areas too. And that really affected the local wrestling companies. Because let's face it, if you're a regular person, you can only go to one show a month and both companies are running, you then have to choose. And if your choice is between the small independent local company and the big national growing company, a lot of people veered off onto that other side into the big international brand. WWF. Now fast forward to 1985, Vince McMahon is about to put on his biggest show to date, Wrestlemania. And anyone who knows anything about Vince McMahon knows he is truly, truly ambitious. So he wanted to go big or go home. He invested all money possible into this event. So there's the backstory with that in mind. Let's go into the show itself. It took place March 31st, 1985, at the most famous arena in the world, Madison Square Garden in Manhattan, New York. 19,121 people were jam-packed into the old Madison Square Garden to see what was dubbed as the greatest wrestling event of all time. And that was Vince McMahon's way of really putting his marker down and saying, listen, we are the number one in the entire game. You have to watch this show. Now, it wasn't the typical pay-per-view that we got to know in years to come. For younger viewers, it wasn't the typical WWE network that we have today. No, people had to actually go out to places like theatres and see it on closed circuit television. Now, if you're under 16, you are probably mind blown by the idea of people going out to cinemas to go and see stuff like pro wrestling live in a cinema and not just watching it in your house on an app like the WWE Network or now Peacock. The show itself, it started very, very slow to be completely honest with you. It was about four minutes until we ever had any kind of wrestler introduced. Up until then, we saw lots of very slow moving video packages and stuff like that that wasn't really needed in my opinion. And not to forget Mean Gene Oakland singing the national anthem. <laughs> USA! 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 Now I've got a question for my American viewers. What do you think about the national anthem at WrestleMania? Because this is something completely alien to the rest of the world. I know before all your sports games, you play the national anthem. I don't really understand why, because your sports games aren't national events. They're just events that are happening there and then, like uh, football games in the UK. Unless it's the big final, they're not going to play the national anthem before it. So, what's your opinions of it? Because so, it's easy for me to look at it and say, it's daft, I don't get it. But hey, you're in that situation, what do you think? 
drop me in the comments down below. When we finally got to the first match, we had Tito Santana taking on the Executioner, who was played by Buddy Rose. Having watched this match back for the first time in a couple years, I bet Vince McMahon would be pulling his hair out if he was watching it, because this is the way that you're introducing this brand new brand to the world. WrestleMania, the entire world is going to know about it sooner rather than later. And you're starting it off with Tito Santana versus the Executioner. And remember what I said, Vince McMahon's thrown all this money at this. So for me, it doesn't really make too much sense why this would be the first match. One thing they might have been expecting is because people had to actually go out to the theatre to do this. And again, these are the days before Google Maps and those kind of things. Maybe they're expecting some people to kind of get there a little bit late and maybe miss the first match, so put something on that doesn't matter too much. That's the only real reason why I can see we're putting this on first. The match ends with Tito Santana hitting his patented flying elbow on the Executioner and then wrapping him up in a figure four leg lock. As he puts the figure four leg lock on the commentary team, who is Jesse Ventura and Gorilla Monsoon, they mention, oh... This is a bit of a spit in the face to Greg the Hammer Valentine, who he's kind of feuding with at the time. Which again, is absolutely mind-boggling. If this is your way of launching a brand new brand WrestleMania, why don't you have Tito Santana versus Greg Valentine on this show? Why are you having them both against separate people and not blowing off the big story? This is the place where you're supposed to do it. Now, I think this is a good place to mention that I don't think Vincent Mann really realised what kind of a brand he was launching with this WrestleMania show. Vincent Mann thought he was launching the new WWF larger than ever before. He didn't realise that at the same time, he wasn't just going to launch the WWF. He was actually going to launch this brand new thing called WrestleMania. He probably thought this was like a one-off WrestleMania, a huge event to get loads of people interested in. Maybe do other big events through time, but not do the same ones over and over again. But hey, that's what WrestleMania grew into. Next up, you had King Kong Bundy with Jimmy Hart in his corner, taking on Special Delivery Jones. Now, this match truly calls back to simpler, simpler times. It is a 25-second squash match on the first WrestleMania. King Kong Bundy basically just squashes him in the corner, does a splash in there, splashes him on the ground, one, two, three, it's all over. Yes, there have been some examples of squash matches in future years in WrestleMania, but they've always been a kind of jokey way, never in a serious way. This was really a serious way to push King Kong Bundy and get him over. Then we had Ricky the Dragon Steamboat taking on Matt Bourne. Now, Matt Bourne is more famous for becoming Doink the Clown later on in his career, but what I didn't know is that he actually comes from a famous wrestling family. To Bourne to fly, ladies and gentlemen. Get your, get your camera. No, no, he's not related to Evan Bourne. He's related to tough Tony Bourne. Again, this match wasn't very special. Ricky Steamboat in the 80s would really cement himself as one of the greatest pro wrestlers of all time, but he didn't really get to showcase that in this match, I think it was about four or five minutes long. The finish came with like a really, really big high spot for the time, which was a crossbody from the top rope. Something that was replicated later on in the show. Which led to Ricky Steamboat getting the one, two, three, becoming victorious, but didn't really do much for me. Next up is another head scratcher as David Sammartino takes on Brutus Beefcake. Keep him out of there while this haircut job is being done. No, 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 no. This is before he went to Barber College. The reason why this is such a head scratcher to me is that Bruno Sammartino is only 49 at the time. Now, I get it. You're sat there thinking, 49? That's quite old for a pro wrestler. It is quite old for a pro wrestler. But Bruno was such a huge draw, especially in Madison Square Garden. But if he's only 49, surely you can tempt him out of retirement for this big, huge show. You're trying to launch the WWF into the stratosphere. Get Bruno back. Really put yourselves on the map. But no, we got David and he really didn't live up to his father's name. Johnny Valiant was in Brutus the Barber Beefcake's corner. And this is where the finish came. Basically, Valiant and Bruno both ended up getting involved. And then it was called a double disqualification. I really don't know why they couldn't have just done David and Bruno San Martino versus any random tag team because that would have actually been much better than this. Next up was Intercontinental Champion Greg Valentine taking on Challenger, the Junkyard Dog. One thing that I really enjoyed about this match was the spot that Junkyard Dog does where he's on his hands and knees 
and he basically does a scamper across the ring and will headbutt his opponent. He'll do it three times, do a little roll around in between. I think that is a great, great move and could be used in modern day pro wrestling to high effect. The match ends with Greg the Hammer Valentine rolling up the junkyard dog, pinning him with his feet on the ropes when all of a sudden, in runs Tito Santana. They're trying to keep building this feud up when, come on, you should have ended this feud on this show. Anyway, Santana tells the referee, listen, he had his feet on the ropes. For some reason, the referee decides to believe Santana. Surely the referee knows Santana and Valentine are feuding because, come on, if this is real life, he would know that. If this is legitimate, he would know that. The referee then counts Greg Valentine out for the 10 count, while Tito Santana just stands there in the ring looking like John Travolta. Then we had the tag team titles on the line. Barry Windham and Mike Rotunda defended against Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov. Interesting note about this tag team is they're basically like the Hart Foundation in the Anvil married Brett's sister. In this case, Rotunda married Wyndham's sister. And they ended up having children. I don't know whatever became of them. Of course, their two sons, Bray Wyatt and Bo Dallas, ended up signing WWE contracts themselves a lot more recently. Of course, all the heat in this match comes from the bare, simple fact that Nikolai Volkov and the Iron Sheik are both foreigners. Basically, WWE taking complete advantage of the xenophobia of the fans. The match starts off with Volkov saying, Hey everyone, I would like you to all stand up and listen to me sing my national anthem. Of course, all the crowds start booing. But why? At the start of the show, when it was your national anthem, you had nothing but love for that. But now it's somebody else. It's ah, get away. We don't want any of that noise. And speaking of Nikolai Volkov, I actually met him during WrestleMania 31 week in San Jose. There's a handy picture right there. As you can see, I'm cracking a joke. If you want to see more pictures like that, head over to the playlists on my channel. You can see all my WrestleMania Day in the Life videos where I went to WrestleMania 30, 31, 32 and 33 and I filmed every single day so you can share the experience with me. Also, Iron Sheik's pro was, he used to say the same thing every time, but I mean, it never made any sense. He would always say, Iran, number one, Russia, number one, America, hack tui. I don't know if you know how rankings work, Mr. Sheik, but only one can be number one. Someone has to be number two. Is it Russia or is it Iran? One thing that I will say about this match is that it was probably the most exciting one up until this point. Now, I don't know if that's because of the tag team element. They could do more stuff with it. Whether it was the... Whether the fact they were doing stuff with the managers on the outside, like Captain Noel Bano was with Rotunda and Wyndham, Blassie was with Sheik and Volkov, or whether it's just the pure, pure fact that everyone in there just hated them because they weren't American. The match ends when the Iron Sheik nails Barry Wyndham with Freddie Blassie's cane. Sheik and Volkov get the cover, get the win, and they become the brand new tag team champions of the world. After the match, Sheik, Volkov, and Blassie had a promo, which is decent, but you know, Iron Sheik, he just keeps playing the hits. Alfred Hayes had a promo, and he just kept on messing it up. And then Mean Gene Oakland interviews Bobby Heenan with Big John Studd, and it is a really, really good promo, actually. Not so much for Bobby Heenan and Big John Studd, but more for Mean Gene Oakland. Studd and Heenan, they have $15,000 in this bag. And basically, Mean Gene, like, it's at eye level, he's like that, trying to peek over and look into it. Very, very subtle, but absolutely brilliant. That leads on nicely to the next match as Andre the Giant suck on Big John Studd. The story of this match was that Andre said that I can slam Big John Studd. Big John Studd said, well, if you think so, put your money where your mouth is. If you can't do it, you've got to retire. But I will literally put my money where my mouth is. And I will put $15,000 on the line. And if you can beat me, you win the money. A huge thing of note in this match was Andre's great facials. But the WWE camera team set up at the time wasn't as good. So it didn't pick them up in great close-ups. Of course it was a slow plodding match which ends with Andre slamming Big John Studd, winning the money, he starts taking notes out, throwing it to the crowd, as he does that Bobby Heenan comes, snatches the bag and they both run away. Then we go to Alfred Hayes again with another poor promo. We then go to Wendy Richter and Cindy Lauper and we see our first celebrity involvement of the night. 
For anyone young watching and you're not too sure who Cindy Lauper is, not to worry. She sang Girls Don't Want Our Fun. It was a huge, huge hit of the 80s. And I'm sure your parents can tell you all about it. The Richter Lauper promo was actually pretty decent and Cindy Lauper was really good in it, I thought. Then on the flip side, you had the fabulous Mula and Leilani Kai and their promo wasn't very good at all. They stumbled through it, they got through it, but hey, this is truly a different era in terms of promos. Then we go to the women's match as Wendy Richter challenges the WWF Women's Champion Leilani Kai. One thing I really want to point out about this match is the action for the time was actually quite decent. They were doing a lot of fast-paced stuff for the time, a lot of high-flying stuff. It is a world away from the current era stuff, obviously, but I think the women's wrestling at the time didn't get the credit it deserves. Because Richter and Lai were doing things that the men just simply weren't doing. Now this match finishes the same as the Steamboat match, but with a little flip on it. Lani Kai goes to the top rope, does a flying cost body. Wendy Richter really struggles with doing the flip over when they get to the ground to do the reversal, but she finally managed it, she got the cover and she became brand new women's champion. Then we had the main event of the evening as Hulk Hogan and Mr. T with Jimmy Snooker by their side, suck on Roddy Piper and Paul Orndorff with Cowboy Bob Orton by their side. Of course, Cowboy Bob Orton is Randy Orton's father. My father and my grandfather, they were in this business for the last 50, 60 years. But this is where the celebrity involvement really starts to pick up. We start off with a special guest timekeeper as Liberace is in charge of ringing the bell. Then Billy Martin is announced as the ring announcer and I'll be honest with you, he was very flat, very bland, but at the time he was the New York Yankees baseball manager and we're in Madison Square Garden. So not just the head of one of the most famous sports teams in the world, but also in the city that they play in. Then they announce a special guest referee, and it's Muhammad Ali. But fortunately, because of Ali's capacity at the time, he wasn't really capable of it, and WWE didn't really trust him that much to be able to carry the match. Because a little peek behind the curtain, the referee helps out with the flow of the match. And it really is a skilled job where a good referee will really add to the quality of a match. Not from what we can see as a viewer, but from what he helps the wrestlers do in the ring. So with that in mind, they put Pat Patterson in charge. And Pat Patterson, for anyone who doesn't know, was always the brains behind a lot of the great finishes that we saw in WWF. And I met him in New Orleans. I don't know what the hell I'm wearing there, or what's going on with my hair, or my face, but I met him. So now the match is about to start. Roddy Piper, Paul Londorf, and Bob Orton come down to the ring to a live bagpipe band. Then a Hulk Hogan, Jimmy Snooker and Mr. T come down, but unfortunately I've got this tagged classics version where they'd edited what music they came down to, so I don't really know. I've got a feeling that it might have been Rocky, but hey, maybe not. Now for all the celebrity involvement in this match, you've got Liberace, you've got Billy Martin, you've got Muhammad Ali, you've got Mr. T. Me, personally as a wrestling fan, I would have preferred a WWF heavyweight title match. Because this is the only WrestleMania ever which doesn't feature one. Because that's what we all want to see as fans. But Vince McMahon wasn't thinking that way. He thought this was just a one-off show. How do we get the WWF to be as big as possible? We have this mega match where Mr. T wrestles. And by the way, how 80s is this? Muhammad Ali... Mr. T and Hulk Hogan all in one. There's an absolute load of tomfoolery in this match. Obviously, they needed to pad it out as much as possible because Mr. T can't wrestle. They had to work around that, but they had to involve him as much as possible to give the fans watching value for money. And one thing that you can't avoid seeing, there's tons of people everywhere, not just in the stands, but all around the ring, you've got all the hangers on, you've got all the security, all the policemen, all the photographers, there's just tons and tons of people surrounding the ring. The match ends when Orton, with the cast on his arm, accidentally hits Orndorff in the back of the head. Hulk and Mr. T get the one, two, three. They win. They send all the fans home happy. Now, in terms of an overall show, WrestleMania 1, what is my overall thoughts? If you're to judge it in a historical context, this is truly a historical show. It's what launched the WWF into the stratosphere, getting all the celebrities involved, all the rock and wrestling type of stuff. It really is a landmark show. But 
if you're to view this from a modern perspective, if you're going to ask me what I view this show as in terms of my daily viewing, would I put this DVD in the player? Mm, probably not. But I think the best way to judge a wrestling show is how I would sell it to my nephews. Now I've got two nephews who absolutely love pro wrestling. They tell me that they're growing out of it a little bit, but I know they're not. And I know you're probably watching, so hello boys, be good, do all your homework. Why are you wasting time watching my video when you could be doing that? You better have done it. I mean, I don't want to get told off by their mum and dad if they spend all their time watching my videos instead of doing the homework. I don't want to be the bad guy in this situation, do I? And if I was going to sell it to them, I'd probably grade it at about a 6 out of 10 because of the historical context of the show. Now, the matches themselves, there's no match on this entire card that I would look at and go, watch this match. This is a really good match. This is a match that you cannot miss. But as an overall show, I would definitely say this is one that all wrestling fans should watch. Because for me anyway, I get more enjoyment when I know the historical context of what's going on. Like if you watch WrestleMania 1 and compare it to WrestleMania 35, for example, you go, wow, I cannot believe how far it's come. I really appreciate all the things that go into making this great show. But if you watch WrestleMania 35 in a vacuum, and maybe you just watch it in a vacuum with maybe 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, etc., then you're going to judge it a lot differently because the scope of reference is so similar to that as the show itself. Okay, so that's my thoughts on the show, but fantasy booker time. How would I change it? So the big glaring thing on the show is there's no WWF World Heavyweight title match. So... I would change it by having Hulk Hogan cheated out of the belt by Roddy Piper maybe about two or three months before this. <laughs> That's a big sucker now. That's a giant belt for sure. Afterwards, Hulk, he's feeling down and out. Then his friend, Mr. T, shows up on the scene and he's like, come on, Hulk, you can do it. But Hogan's like, ah, I'm not too sure about that. Then Piper hears it and he's like, hey, T, what are you doing getting involved in my business? And then we start this feud here. Roddy Piper versus Mr. T for the WWF title at WrestleMania 1. Can you imagine how big the draw would have been having Mr. T have a title shot at WrestleMania? As far as the match would go, you could still have the chicanery, the Tom Fuller, you could still have all that involved in there. Roddy Pipe would obviously beat Mr. T, but then what? But then Hulk Hogan will come down to the ring just like WrestleMania 9. He snapped out of it. He's out of his funk. He's like, right, I'm going to challenge you, Roddy Piper, right now for the title. Hogan challenges him right there and then. They have a match. Hogan wins, comes away with the title belt. Now, I know it didn't go down well at WrestleMania 9, but that's because by WrestleMania 9... Everyone was sick of Hogan. But at this point, the fans want to see him hold that title belt. So this would have been a great, great move. But obviously, you can't have WrestleMania without Hulk Hogan booked and announced for the show. So I would have him against his good real-life friend, Brutus Beefcake. A nice, easy match for him. He can wrestle his mate and then he can beat him and go over strong. Another glaring miss on this show is Greg Valentine versus Tito Santana, like I mentioned earlier. So they should have butted heads right here for the IC title. As far as the rest of the show goes, I'd actually keep everything pretty much how it is. Obviously, Junkyard Dog and the execution of both lead opponents now, so stick them together. And then we've got David Sammartino and Bruno Sammartino. I would have done everything I could to get Bruno Sammartino involved put him in a tag team match against literally anyone just to have that big pop and that great moment on WrestleMania 1. So what do you think of that? Do you think my WrestleMania 1 is better than Vince McMahon's WrestleMania 1? Obviously I have the benefit of hindsight. Or do you have a better idea than either of those two? Drop it in the comments down below whether you think it's my WrestleMania, Vince's WrestleMania or your alternative card. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please feel free to hit the subscribe button down below. Ding the notification bell, that way you'll be notified every time I make a video. I plan on going on this journey now through WrestleMania 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I mean, I can't count any higher than that, but you know how it goes. With that, I am out. Thank you very, very much for watching.